Throughout our lives, many of us will be tested by traumatic life events. These midlife jolts can either propel us or they can derail us, taking us back to square one. These jolts can create a lifetime of purpose, create new relationships, new careers, new worldviews, and a clarity of your mission on earth. That jolt came to me on January 15th, 2009, when I survived the plane crash known as the Miracle on the Hudson. Over the next 50 minutes, I'm gonna share with you how by being resourceful and employing your own personal leadership skills, not only you can be able to survive, but you can thrive. And you don't need a plane crash for God to reveal his purpose to you. Before we start, I wanna ask a question. Anybody here seen that movie, Sully? Anybody seen the movie? A few of you, great, cool. Hey, Clint Eastwood did an amazing job and wasn't Tom Hanks fabulous? He did an amazing, it was a, and I was just very honored to be a very small part of that experience. But one thing the passengers knew then, and we all know now who've seen it know now, this, that movie was not about the plane crash. It was about the amazing journey of the captain. And the captain and the crew did a fabulous job that day, and I will be forever grateful. But now, let me take you inside a miracle. Let me tell you my story. January 15th, 2009 was a Thursday. That week started for me on Tuesday in Sarasota, Florida. On Wednesday, we went to a manufacturing plant in Petersburg, Virginia. When we got done, we went to Richmond, jumped on a train to go to New York, because the next day, we were gonna work in the distribution center in Brooklyn, New York. Now, I don't know if here's ever been or worked inside of a distribution center, but they normally open quite early in the morning. This one opened at two o'clock in the morning. So our day started about five and we got done about 10. Now, I travel over 100,000 miles a year of what I do in my job, so any chance to get home to my wife and my four kids a little early, I usually try to take advantage of that. So about 10 o'clock that morning, I called our travel agent to work with her and she put me on flight 1549. I gave up a first class seat at five o'clock for seat 15A to be on 1549. That moment, that decision changed the entire direction of my life. But I was grateful. I was going home. I was going to see my family. Now, that day was 11 degrees and snowing. So when I got to the airport, the planes were backed up. And that's no big deal in New York, right? I mean, it, things happen like that all the time. So I was one of the first set of passengers to board the plane that day because of my status with U.S. Airways. I was a chairman, I was top tier. So I went back to my seat, I went to seat 15A. That's four rows behind that left wing. And I did exactly what I did every single time when I got on a the plane then. And I hallucinate what you do when you get on a plane now. I went back to my seat, I put my briefcase down, I put my wallet in the briefcase, pulled the magazine out and I started to read. I did not listen to the flight crew. I did not know where those exits were. I did not read that little brochure they always tell you to read. But I guarantee you every single time I get on a plane now, I do. Because now I know how important it is to be aware on a plane. And I don't know if here's ever flown out of LaGuardia, but if you, have, if you haven't, you basically go out over the bay. It's a runway that goes out in the bay and all of a sudden you start turning north. And about 60 seconds after we took off, it's when I heard an explosion. It was a loud explosion. Man, I had never heard anything on a plane like that before. So it got my attention. So I looked up and I looked out the window and I saw fire coming out beneath the left wing. So I knew something had happened by a flash of loss. I thought plane lost an engine. No big deal. It really didn't startle me too much. But see, that's where I think God's grace entered for the first moment on this flight. Because no one on the plane knew at that moment in time what happened on the left side of the plane also happened on the right side of the plane. And I truly believe I even were to cross-reference or checked in and say, hey, man, what'd you see? Hey, man, what'd you hear? It could have been a lot of panic. People panic, people lose their heads. When people start to lose their heads, they start making irrational decisions. But this day, 10 years later, the one thing that stays with me, and I bet if you talk to any passenger on that plane, they'll tell you the same thing. It was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. The guy next to me, elbow, he said, hey, man, what's going on? I said, I think we're going back to the airport. I felt him banking. I saw I was going back to the airport. But as we were banking, all of a sudden, I looked out the window, and I saw something I had never, ever seen before. I saw the skyline of Manhattan up close and personal. I looked out the window a little further, and all of a sudden, I see this bridge coming up. And all of a sudden, as we're approaching the bridge, when I heard the only thing I heard the entire time on this plane 
when the captain said, this is your captain, brace for impact. Now, I never heard that one on a plane before, so that one got my attention. So at that point in time, all of a sudden, I did two things. First thing I did is I prayed. I prayed, whoever that dude is up front, man, just get me down in one piece. Just get me down in one piece. Second thing I prayed for is the last person I spoke with, who was my client in Brooklyn, to call my wife and tell her that I loved her. And the third thing is I prayed to God to forgive my sins. I don't want anything to mean God at this point. I'm going down, I want to go up, and it ain't looking good for me right now. And the second thing I did is I reached down in my briefcase and got my wallet out and shoved it down into my pants because something did happen, which looked like it was probably going to happen. At least they could claim my body. At least my family would know who I was. Now, I don't know anybody here knows anything about the George Washington Bridge. That bridge is roughly 600 feet up. The plane at that point in time was roughly 1,000 feet and descending. So we were only clearing the bridge by roughly 400 feet. And as we were clearing the bridge, I looked out the window and you could see people's faces looking up at you. That's how close we were to that bridge. And it was about 60 seconds after we crossed over the bridge is when we crashed into the river. And people ask me all the time, I said, what was that like? What was that moment like? I was telling them, well, some people were calling people. Some people were texting people. What happened to me is this. That last moment, I saw the movie of my life pass before my eyes. I saw things, guys, with such clarity I had not seen. It was like 4K. I had not seen it. When I played Little League Baseball, when I went to high school on my first date, and when I got married and my kids, I saw things in my life with such clarity. I was thinking, this is my life. It's like that show in the 50s. This is your life. I saw my life play out before my eyes. It's a surreal experience. If you've never been there, it's a surreal experience. And like I mentioned, about 60 seconds after we crossed over the bridge when we crashed into the river. And it was a hard hit. When we hit, I went all the way back to my seat and all the way up my seat, and just like that. But when I came back up, I looked up and I looked out the window and I saw light. So I knew I had a shot, but I wasn't out yet. Because if you saw the plane landed, water started coming in immediately. And depending where you were on that plane, I was towards the back of the plane. Water was anywhere from ankle, knee to waist deep, just like that. And I looked out the window one more time, all of a sudden I saw the water was already halfway up the window. This thing's going down. Now you've probably seen that picture, if you saw anything about this, of the plane in the river, right? With the people standing on the wings and people ask me all the time, how those people get out there so quickly? I'm gonna tell you what happened. When I looked out, the, one of the things, the first things I saw is this, people getting on top of the seats to walk down the seats. That's how a lot of people got out of the plane. And that became a great lesson in my life, a great metaphor in my life. Because when, when you think you may only have one way to get something done in life, all of a sudden if you're resourceful and you open your eyes and you pray to God, multiple resources open up in your life. And people were walking down the seats. But I didn't think about getting on top of a seat. My first thought was get to the aisle, get up and get out. When I got to the aisle, something happened only changed that day for me, but changed the entire direction of my life. That moment mattered. I heard my mom talking to me in my head. My mom passed away in 1997. If there was something she would tell me when I was a child that popped into my head, and it was, if you do the right thing, God will take care of you. And the right thing for me was, you take care of other people first. See, I grew up at a small town outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. I ran with a group of guys playing sports and athletics and Boy Scouts. We always ran together and we always had each other's backs. We always had each other's backs. So at that moment, I had made a decision. I'm going to the back of the plane so anybody needed help. So I started climbing over the seats to get to the back of the plane and got behind everybody to start making my way out and checking things out. Now, in the back of the plane, water from anywhere from waist to chest level deep. And based on the impact, some of those bins are now popped open and that luggage is flown out and you're anywhere from waist to chest level deep and you've got luggage floating in the water and you're trying to get out of a plane. It's sinking. And the first light that I saw was on the right side of the plane, 10F. And I started getting out just like everybody else. But when I got to that window, it was an amazing sight. There was no room on that wing for me. There was no room on that boat for me. But it was an amazing sight. People were already being rescued. I don't know who said this, and I give them 100% of the credit when they said that the crew got everybody down that day, the crew and passengers got everybody out that day, but the real heroes of the day were the first responders. 
And the first of the first responders was the New York waterways, that ferries. The ferries there were about two minutes after this plane crashed. And there's a lot of ways to define what a miracle is, guys. But having someone there to rescue you, just a couple minutes after a plane crash in ice cold water, that's the start of a miracle. Now, this picture tells you a lot of what happened that day. This picture is a great picture, but it tells you a lot of what happened. One of the things you see in this picture is this. You do not see the crew. All the crew went out to the left side of the plane. So the right side of the plane was managed and led by passengers who had zero technical experience, who had no training at all. And that became a great lesson in my life. Because one thing that I learned at that moment in time is this. You don't need to know everything about something to lead because people lead people. People don't lead projects. People lead people. So if you step up in your personal leadership and you least start leading, you don't need to know everything about everything. The second thing you see in this picture is this. You'll notice I'm holding on to the lifeboat. And the reason why is this. I don't know anybody here knows anything about the Hudson River. I learned a lot about it over the last several years. It's got an extremely fast current. This plane actually floated down the river about a half a mile in 24 minutes. And as that plane was floating down the river, that little lifeboat was floating out into the river. And they, like I, and I would say probably you if you were on that plane, who reads the instructions? No one reads the instructions. It's actually tethered to the plane, but no one knew that. So they kept yelling at me to hold on, hold on, hold on. And that's why you see me holding on. This little lifeboat, waist deep in 36 degree water for about seven minutes. And also I looked out the wing and something happened to catch my eye. And there was a lady and she was standing there and she wasn't moving, she was stifled. Now you've probably been in meetings and business meetings or in situations where you get somebody or maybe even you sometime, would you get locked? You don't know what to do. You go in that trance, right? I don't know what to do. If I do anything, I can do hurt. I'm not gonna do anything. That's a dangerous position to be in. So I've been, had a lot of training in how to do this. And how you do this, how you do this, break somebody out of that trance, is you have to do something radical to break them out of it. You have to do something really radical. So I started yelling at this lady, just started yelling at her. And she looked at me like, who is this old man yelling at me? But all of a sudden I got her attention. And there was a lady on that lifeboat, got her hand, put her on that lifeboat, and all of a sudden, you see people walking on a wing. You've probably heard the term the wing walkers. That's how it happened. People started walking down the wing. Things were happening. Well, all of a sudden, a couple minutes later, I felt something happen. I felt a shift in the plane. And I didn't know what happened then, but I found out what happened later. What happened was there was a tugboat that was part of the rescue. And as he was backing out because other boats were coming in, he hit the front of the plane. Now, that's not that big of a deal unless you're in the plane. And I was in the plane. We're six, seven minutes into this thing. I'm waist deep plus in the water. And when he hit that plane, it shook the plane. When it shook the plane, I felt water go up my back. And the first thing that I thought that came to my mind said, Titanic. I don't remember that movie. When that movie, that boat tipped up, it sucked everything down in it. And the first thought that I had is do not be sucked down in a plane. Man, you're almost out of here. Do not be sucked down in a plane. So I stop here, I thank my mom and my dad. Because they didn't give me swimming lessons when I was a child. I may never be able to get off this plane. And I start thinking about that moment a few years ago. And it reminded me of a moment when I was 12 years old. Anybody here ever been a Boy Scouts? Anybody Boy Scouts? Love Boy Scouts. I was a Boy Scout. And I was going for this thing in Boy Scouts. They had this thing called the Order of the Arrow Award. Anybody been to Order of the Arrow? Know what I'm talking about? It's basically when your dad drops you off when you're 12 years old, so I've seen in a couple of days. It's like Survivor on steroids, all right? It's like you do have to do all these activities and they give you this log this big and you have to whittle it down to a shape of an arrow at the end of this so you can present it to be a member. So we were doing all these activities and one of the activities we had to do is this. We had to get across a river to get to the next activity. Now, yes, you could walk, they had a bridge, you could walk down the bank, cross the bridge, but man, we're 12 years old. We jump in the river and start swimming across the river. I thought, was that the moment when I was 12 years old it was gonna give me the surgery to do what I was about to do? Because when I felt that plane shift, I'm like, I am out of here. So I jumped in and started swimming to the closest boat that I could find. That was the longest 10 yard swim in my life. Because not only was the water 36 degrees, but one thing everybody forgets, now there's jet fuel in the water. 
Now, when I got back to Charlotte and I went to the optometrist and they did the exam, I had my eye, it was a little hazy, so I went to see him. And he looked in and did the exam and they found black spots in my eye. And we think that's jet fuel that got stuck in my eye from swimming. That's why today, folks, you see me wearing glasses because we think we got jet fuel in the eye from that swimming. But I got there, I got to the end of the wing. Now, the ferry I went to, you see that one right there, it's got a metal ladder. That's not the kind of ferry I went to. If you saw the movie, they had the one of the ferries that had the plastic ladder they roll down. See, they don't have elevators to take you out of the water. They don't get paid to rescue people. They get paid to take people back and forth from Jersey, New York. They don't get paid to rescue people. Mine had a plastic ladder. So I got up to the back, so my backside close up and they're yelling, climb, climb, climb. And I yelled up, can't, can't, can't. And then my mom started talking to me again. Because the word my mom hated most in life was the word can't. If you grew up in our house, you said, I can't to my mom. She looked at you and I said, if you can't do it, you're gonna do it. I figured out after my mom passed away that her whole worldview, her whole life was, if you can't, you must. So I got one arm up, I felt somebody grab it. Other arm up, I felt somebody grab it. To this day, I do not know who these two gentlemen are, but they pulled me on one of those ferries, threw me over the side. Now I'm sliding on the ice in the ferry. I don't even know what's going on now. Now I'm yelling, get up, get up, get up. And I got to the side of the ferry, I'm like, man, I made it. But I didn't, because that was my moment. One of the groups I love speaking for the most are firefighters. Anybody here a firefighter? Love firefighters, guys, I love them. Because one of the, I just spend a lot of time with these guys. And when you see these pictures, right? You see these firefighters going into it. Man, they got it going, right? And the next thing you see of a firefighter or EMT, they're sitting on the curb, man. They have nothing left. They gave it all, man. They gave all their, that's what happened to me. I gave it all. I had nothing left. I can't explain how cold 36 degree water is for an extended amount of time. That's hard to explain. But I had nothing left but it's amazing where God puts people in times of a crisis. Because there was a guy on this ferry. He had a gray suit on. He had his laptop over his back, but most importantly, he was dry. But what did he have? He had an iPhone. He walked right up to me, put this in my face, said, call your wife, call your wife. And I couldn't dial it, but I could get the number out. And if iOS 12 is working right now, you're gonna hear what was said that day from the ferry why all this was going on. That's all I could get out. This is your dad. I've been in a plane crash. Now, my wife's not home waiting for me to give her blow by blow of my day. She actually has a real life. She's taking our son to basketball practice while all this was going down. So my daughter, who was in that year, she was a junior in high school, was the one who got that message, turned the TV on, saw this going on, and she's the one who had to communicate to my family that I'd been in a plane crash, but she knew nothing else. Now, anybody here not been in New York or New Jersey? Anybody? A few people? Cool. I get to do a geography lesson. Love geography. This picture, like I said, tells you so much. So you look at this picture closely. In the middle of that picture, that's the Empire State Building in the middle of it. Those big buildings on, on the left up there, that's Manhattan. So if over there's New York, the other side of the river is Jersey. And five years ago, I had the high honor and privilege of speaking with one of the people who wrote the plan for maritime rescues in the Hudson. He and I did a conference down in New Orleans, a plan execution. Man, he talked about it. it was a cool talk, two hour talk. I learned so much from him. But one of the things I learned was pretty basic. Wherever the closest point to shore you were is where are you gonna go? So you see how the plane's situated. The left side of the plane is facing towards Manhattan. The right side of the plane is facing towards Jersey. And I found out later they radioed ahead because they knew that I'd been in the water. So when we hit shore, there were three people waiting just for me. There were two EMTs and a guy from the American Red Cross with a blanket. And that's why I now speak internationally for the American Red Cross. Because a little known fact about that day is this, which you would not get in the media. This is bonus information. There were a lot of groups that touched a lot of people that day. But there were two groups that touched every one of us. Ferries, the waterways, and the Red Cross on both the New York and New Jersey side. And I'm honored and privileged tonight that the CEO of the Tennessee Red Cross is here with us tonight, celebrating this tonight to be part of the man up. His name's Joel Sullivan. I wanna recognize him right now for what he does every day with the Red Cross. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't walk. 
So they picked me up and carried me to a triage center. Now, if you've never been to a triage center, it's a room with nothing in it. There ain't nothing special about a triage center. They put me next to the wall, stripped all my clothes off down to my skivvies, and Heather, my EMT, says, I'll be right back. So now I'm on the floor of my underwear. Well, I don't even know what's going on now. I look over here, and this guy is sore like I am. I look over here, and this girl didn't have any underwear on. But it's amazing when you're floor naked with two people. Everybody's looking, but ain't nobody talking. It's a very weird feeling. I was, I was just in the water, and I'm naked with two people. What's going on now, all right? And all of a sudden, I look up, and I see this guy walking towards me. He had a card in his hand. He came up and said, sir, I need your name. I need your date of birth. He writes on the card. He puts it around my right ankle. He walks away. Now, I don't know when y'all grew up. I grew up in the 70s. There's a TV show called MASH. When they take your toe, they're carting you out, man. It's game over. You didn't make it. You're going to the big casino in the sky, buddy. It is over. And that's exactly what I thought. I was on the floor. I was naked. I was ice cold. I could barely breathe. I had to take my foot. I must be dead. I said, it's a movie ghost. The movie ghost is true. I am watching myself die. I didn't make it. I'm just watching this thing play out. But all of a sudden, Heather comes back. She's got to take your blood pressure. I said, Shh, good blood pressure. We like blood pressure. Unfortunately, mine was 190 over 120. And she goes, you gotta go stat. And when you hear stat, you're going someplace. She goes, you gotta go stat. You could have a heart attack or stroke. You have to go right now. And the first thing I thought was, man, I survived a plane crash. I got out of the water. And now I'm gonna die of a heart attack or stroke. Man, it just keeps coming, man, right? All of a sudden now we're in fast motion. They put me on this gurney and wheel me out. And you gotta remember, this is New York media capital of the world, at the busiest time, rush hour, there's people every place. I had never seen anything like this in my life. And they're trying to take me down to the ambulance. But there was a guy from NBC with his camera on his shoulder who had a story. Last passenger out, they had a story. He's following us. They're putting me in the ambulance, he's jumping in. They're pushing him out, he's jumping in. They're pushing him out. There's chaos in the ambulance. Man, I don't even know what's going on now. But they take me to this place a couple minutes away called Palisades Medical Center. And once again, People from New Jersey get a bad rap. Because one thing about people in New Jersey, they know how to respond. So when we roll in, they open these doors, there's like 20 or 30 people waiting just for me. And all of a sudden, these 10 women come running up with blankets. I didn't know why until I found out later. With all the commotion over at the triage center, the gurney got stuck. They couldn't get the gurney out. So these 10 women picked me up, carried me to this bed where there was a doctor, and now it is go time. Now the doctor's giving out orders. He goes, blood pressure, they take it again. 190 over 120. Knew that wasn't good because Heather said I could have a heart attack or stroke. That's not good. They yelled out oxygen. They yelled out 75. Man, I didn't know what that meant. I found out later, uh, that's not good. They yelled out temperature. They took it orally, it was 96. Then he yelled out anally, and all of a sudden, I got that one. I know exactly what that means. When my mom said that, I know what's coming now. I have no control over it, Right? And Nurse Bautista, who's on my right arm, she's my angel, guys. She stayed with me the entire night. She yells back at the doctor, I can't get him off. I can't get him off. Because what happened was my body was so cold and so wet, my underwear was stuck to my hips, like frozen to my hips. She couldn't, they couldn't get him off. So what every, does every nurse have? Scissors like this long, right? Clip, clip, rip. And all I got left in this whole world is my watch. Because my temperature was 94. That's how I diagnosed you with hypothermia. And it took them five hours to warm my body up. That's how cold my body was, five hours. But that was an amazing five hours. Not only did I get to meet the former governor of New Jersey, the head of Port Authority, New York State Police, New Jersey State Police, FBI, Homeland Security. They wanna to talk to me and the gentleman was on my left. He was the first passenger out. If you saw the movie, the guy who jumped out, started swimming, he was the first passenger out. On impact, he fractured his sternum. But the reason they wanted to talk to us is this. Once again, this is a little known fact, which you will not get in the media is bonus information. Out of 150 passengers, not crew, passengers, 21 of us went to the hospital. 18 went to New York City hospitals, like Columbia, Beth Israel, those city hospitals. Three of us went to Palisades over in Jersey. Out of those 21 people, two people stayed the night, Barry and I. 148 passengers walked home just a couple hours after a plane crash in ice cold water. Now, if you saw the movie, you kept hearing people say, I need a number, I need a number. It took them that long to get a number because everybody was going home. It was like seven o'clock that night. If you go back and watch the same, about seven o'clock that night when the governor of New York came out, this is, this is truly a miracle on the Hudson. That was God's name because they couldn't find everybody. 
but they could find us and they had questions. And the reason they wanted to ask us questions is this, because they couldn't get to the crew and the movie had it accurate. The crew was locked down at the Courtyard Marriott LaGuardia. Nobody got to the crew that night. They were locked down. So we were getting questions all night long. And one of the questions I got was, do you think this was a terrorist attack? You have planes going towards bridges towards Manhattan. Somebody has to answer the question. And we were the only ones gonna answer that question at that point. But all night long, I kept telling the doctor, I have no clothes. I have no clothes. And the doctor kept saying, well, why do you need clothes? You're in a hospital. See, I did not know you did not need clothes in a hospital. I wasn't obviously one thing. I thought you needed clothes. But what he didn't realize is this. Not only did all the authorities know where we were at, but all the media knew where we were at. And we read the Good Morning America, the early show on Fox and Friends, and all I had to wear is my watch. So somebody from the Northern New Jersey chapter of the Red Cross went out and got some really ugly sweats for me to wear that next day. If you go back and watch the videos from that day, you'll see these sweats, but that told me something, guys. God provides. When you have nothing. See, I don't know if anybody in this room has ever had nothing. I'm talking, you have no clothes, you have no money, you have no food, you have no friends, you have nothing. And somebody goes out and this gives you a stitch of clothing, God provides. Now, when something like this happens, I hope you never have to go through it, but if you do, just know this. Every airline's got their own emergency response team, just as is U.S. Airways. And each one of us got our own liaison, our own person. Mine was Doreen from Pittsburgh. Doreen came in about midnight that night and she had one job, anything that Dave wanted, take care of Dave. So all night long, you know, there are people coming in, she's trying to get under control. It was chaotic at the hospital, they'll, they'll tell you that. And she finally called my wife about midnight because I didn't have a phone. I got to use Doreen's phone. I finally called my wife. So the next morning when I and Barry and I go down to do these shows, she's making plans to get me back to Charlotte where I live. So we get done with these shows and we come back and I'm like, listen, I said, I feel good now, let's go. I wanna go home now. She goes, listen, I don't want any more stress on you. I'm gonna put you on the 12 o'clock flight home. I said, no, I wanna go home now. She goes, no, you don't understand. I can't get you this. No, you don't understand. My wife and kids are at the airport. They're probably freaking out. I wanna go home now. She goes, no, you don't understand. She said, you are in Weehawken, New Jersey. You're going out of LaGuardia. It's, it's about nine o'clock. That flight leaves at 10. I can't get you there. Well, I told you the night before, everybody wanted to be my friend. They all left their car and said, call me if you need anything. I cashed in. I'm gonna tell you right now who the most important person in New York is, the director of Port Authority. He gave his car, I said, call him. He said, he'd help me. She looked at me and said, you want me to call? I said, call him. He said, he'd help me. She said, I thought you were freaking out on me. Started melting down. She got all big eyed, right? She walked out the door and called the director of Port Authority. Six minutes later, I had a police escort. They take me from Weehawken, New Jersey to LaGuardia in 16 minutes in a pimped out Escalade, me and my hoodie. Let's tell you, that is a miracle. Listen, <laughs> if you ever have the chance to take a police escort through Manhattan, take it. There ain't nothing like it, right? Back on January 15th, I did the 10th anniversary up there for this year. It took me two hours to get across the bridge, right? You just can't get from New Jersey to New York. So we get there, right? It's pretty cool. I have to admit, it's pretty cool. We get there, I do one quick interview, but I just want to go home, right? So I go up, man, I have nothing to check. Let's go. But we all forgot one critical detail. Me too. I didn't have an ID. How am I going to get through TSA without an ID? Well, it worked once. Played the Homeland Security guy's card at TSA. I played it. The guy looks at me and says, sir, why well, do I want to call the director of New Jersey Homeland Security? So he knows who I am. Please call him. And he did. And I got through TSA without an ID. TSA will tell you, that's a miracle, right? Listen, you go over here to BNA and say, I don't have an ID. See what happens. Ain't nobody playing games right now, right? No one's playing games. So what they give, they give me something that I had never got in my life, this thing called an entourage. You may never have an entourage? I never had one. It's like 20 people want to walk me down to the plane, right? That's cool, right? So I had like 20 people walking me down to the plane and there's a little commotion out there, but they walked me right in and sat me down in first class. This is an upgrade, Right? Doreen's over there talking to Beth, the flight attendant, and the captain and the first officer walk out. I said, hey, what's going on? He said, we deboarded the plane. I said, why? He goes, well, we want to talk to you. We have never talked to anybody who survived a plane crash. So they, well, they're holding, they read, we're having a one-on-one -on -one interview in first class. It's about the day before. They were firing questions at me, but what he weren't ex wasn't expecting is this. I had questions for him. Like, are you going to get me over this bridge? Are you going to get me home? And the captain says, says, sir, I will get you home safely. What I'll do for you is this. When we hit 3,000 feet, and man, that was the first time I heard that. I didn't know the plane only got 3,000 feet. What I'll do is I'll ring the bell and you and I will know where this happened yesterday. 
So he put me back in coach. I did not get first class. I got, the, got free potato chips, free Cokes. Beth, the flight attendant, did a great care of me. She was my angel. She left the middle seat open. She was my angel. Left the middle seat open. I put the hoodie up like the Unabomber, and I lock it down. I says, get me out of here. And all of a sudden, we take off. I hear ding, ding, ding. I look, oh, I was like, whoa. 3,000 feet isn't that high up. And that's the moment, guys, that everything started coming back to me. I started realizing what happened that day. It all started coming back. I said, wow, this really is a miracle. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever flown from LaGuardia to Charlotte. I used to do it all the time, so I knew the geography pretty well. It's about the Virginia State Line, Greensboro, North Carolina. They basically put your stuff away call, right? You were getting ready to land call. So they make this call, and I haven't talked to anybody but Beth, the flight attendant. But the guy two seats over from me, it was up page four of Newsday. And what is on page four of Newsday? That is the picture right there. So he looks at his face, looks at me and says, hey, were you that guy on that plane? I'm like, what? So he turns and shows me this picture. I'm like, whoa, my picture's in the paper. He goes, you were that guy on that plane, right? He says, the loudest, everybody gets up and looks at the freak show in the hoodie in the back, right? Who's the guy? Who's the guy? And when I'm now we're on final descent. The last time we were on final descent, it really didn't work out real well for me. And people are like, get down, get down. And best run up, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, just get me off this plane last. Just get me off this plane last. So when we land, Beth runs up. Beth's a stud. No one gets by Beth. She's, she's my protector. She's my angel. Everybody needs an angel, right? She's my angel. Just keep on moving, keep on moving, keep on moving. She takes me off the plane last, and yes, my family was there, and also U.S. Airways was there to do the meet and greet, but also the CEO of the Red Cross in North Carolina was there with my family. Folks, that was the most important thing that happened that entire two-day period, because somebody was taking care of my family. Now, what happened was they told me, they were briefing me as we were walking. There's a lot of media there, right? There's media every place. So they put us in the U.S. Airways Club in Charlotte. It was a B-Con course. I've never flown in Charlotte. It's a B-Con course. And gave us the club, basically, until everything got sort of settled down. So we're going out. I don't know if you've ever flown out of Charlotte, but they have these escalators that go down to baggage claim. So we're going, I'm getting on these escalators, and all of a sudden, wall-to-wall media. My son, who then was in second grade, started freaking out. And fortunately for my wife and someone from U.S. Airways, they took them the back way to get them out without give them, God, God bless them for doing that because he was just not, he couldn't deal with it, right? He's, he's second grade. He couldn't deal with it. So I had two of my daughters with me and I'm going down the escalator, I do these interviews, but now I'm home. God provided. I've got gratitude. I survived and I'm home. But that's where my miracle turns into my mission. And I want to tell you now, how's that miracle turns into a mission? And now, how do you fight the good fight. The Sunday after the plane crash, I went to my church. Now that Sunday, everybody wanted to talk to me, but there was one guy who really wanted to talk to me. He's in charge of men's breakfast. He came up to me and said, hey, Dave, will you speak at men's breakfast next Sunday? I said, no problem, man. 50 old guys eating pancakes, got it, walking apart. I didn't know they invited half of Charlotte. Five, 600 people show up and they run out of pancakes. They have hungry, angry Methodists on my hands, all right? Listen, I might be all right for Presbyterians, Episcopalians, and Lutherans. You're going out of food, right? But if you're a Methodist, you better have food. So now I have hungry, angry Methodists. I don't even know what's going on now. So our, our situation is that we have a gym with a stage. That's how our, our church is set up. So I'll go, behind, go up the stage, go behind the curtain like this right here. I said, God, give me something to say, man. Give me something now. Deliver. And he gave me something to say. And I said whatever I said that day. I don't even remember what I said, but obviously I did some, something. I get done speaking, and two men wanted to talk to me. One was from Bank of America. One was from Wachovia. They had people on the plane with me. That's cool. That's no big deal. But all of a sudden, I look up and look in the back of the room. And I see this elderly lady locking me out, just watching me. She catches my eye. She starts making her way up over here, takes a hard left, comes up and interrupts this conversation and grabs my arm really tight, like jump, like, Whoa. But she looked me in the eye and said something that only changed that day for me, but changed the entire direction of my life. That moment changed everything. She looked me in the eye and said, I was questioning if there really is a God. I don't believe in miracles, but you, you, you are physical evidence that there's a God and he does miracles. Thank you, thank you. She let my arm go, looked me in the eye one more time, walked away. I look at these two gentlemen. I've never seen in my life, guys, two men cry like this in my life. They're physically crying. They're bawling right here. My minister was in the back witnessing all this. I looked at him like, what happened? 
but all of a sudden it came to me a couple seconds later. What happened to me on January 15, 2009, it now impacted somebody before she goes to her great beyond wherever that is, now believes there's a God who does miracles because I am physical evidence. So when Robbie and Todd invited me to be here several months ago to be with you this tonight here in Hendersonville, there was no doubt that I was gonna be with you here tonight because I don't know who I'm gonna impact. My wife has only asked for two things this entire time. First thing was, and I was in the parking lot pick, waiting to pick up my daughter for basketball practice. She got a phone call. All right, we got a phone call, but she took the phone call from a guy named Rick Warren. Anybody heard of Rick Warren? Got a call from Rick Warren's office. And she called me and said, hey, this guy named Rick Warren's office called and want to talk to you. So I get on the phone and start talking to Rick Warren's office. And then Rick gets on the phone. He said, I want to interview you. I said, I, I, I'm open to that, but you, on one condition. He said, what is that? I said, I want you to talk to my minister. He goes, why? I said, I, want, I, want, I do not want you to think this is a Saul to Paul. I want people to understand this is, I've always believed that there's a God. I've always believed there's a Jesus, but this is a strong reference for my faith. So he interviewed my minister and me for this interview. And they put it in his book called The Purpose, Purpose Driven Connection. And they did this interview right here. It's called God's Hands Are On All of Us. This is the first magazine interview I ever did with Rick Warren. That's one first thing my wife asked me to do. You know, I was really proud to do this and get the opportunity to meet and be with Rick Warren. Amazing experience. Second thing some, my wife asked me is this. She got a phone call from one of her friends who's a minister at a Presbyterian church. Her name's Joan. And so Terry, my wife, Terry calls and said, listen, Joan called and wants you to speak on Palm Sunday. I said, I'll call her back. I said, I'll do it on one condition. You come hear me speak. She's like, well, I said, you've never heard me speak. You've got to come. If I'm gonna do this, you gotta come hear me speak. And I knew she'd come because Joan's her friend. So we go to this Palm Sunday. Now, Palm Sunday, I don't know about Palm Sunday here. It's a big deal where I'm from. It's a big deal. So we're driving out to beautiful Gastonia, North Carolina, beautiful little Presbyterian church out in the country. And we pull in and all of a sudden, I see all of a sudden, I open, see these doors open and these seats are going out through the parking lot. It's a big deal. So we go in, I talk to the ministers, like I sort of did today with Todd, I sort of get prepped, right? You gotta get prepped. So all of a sudden, you know, before the church service begins, I'm sitting there with my family and all of a sudden the processional's coming in. And all of a sudden I hear the, the hymn coming in. I hear the first chords of the hymn and I start crying like a baby. The hymn was the old rugged cross. And that was my, my grandmother's favorite hymn. I hear, I am crying like a baby. And my daughter goes, dad, man up. Just like that, right on my side. Because we, I was like, we don't cry, right? She's like, well, we don't cry. We man up, right? We were there, we're tough. But here I'm crying like a baby. And my wife's gonna be like, hey, do you cry every time you talk? Are you okay? Are you gonna be able to do it? And my wife's like grilling me right there. I said, I'll be all right, I'll be all right, right? Yeah, right. So if it comes my time to talk, the scripture lesson says, it's my time to talk. Now I'm gonna stop here, I'm gonna go back. You see this picture, this picture's called God's Hands. Now, the first church that I spoke out outside of Charlotte was a place called Oakboro Baptist. This guy kept calling me and calling me. He said, you gotta come speak, you gotta come speak. And I said, fine, I said, okay, I'll come. So I spoke and I had the pulpit at Oakboro Baptist. This, the original of this picture was hanging over my head the entire time. Didn't notice it though. I mean, I was focused, right? Didn't notice it. Now, I didn't know any of you, y'all been to a Baptist church with a minister. When you're done, he graduates, and we're gonna to talk to everybody as we leave. So he's pulling me up the aisle, right? And I'm talking to everybody, we're shaking hands. And all of a sudden, this lady comes running up with the original of this picture. She says, listen, I wanna give you a gift. I said, you don't have to do that. You know, I'm here because God wants me here. It's my, my duty to give back to God. He goes, no, she goes, listen, I had a couple of friends from Bank of America on that plane, on the city exec. Please take this as my gift to you. So I took this, this is the, the original, I've got the original in my office, the original, but I matted like this big. It's beautiful, beautiful. But I travel so much, I can't take the original, so I took a picture of it, okay? We're back to Gastonia now. I've got the original of this, and I put it to the right side of where I speak, always. It's always on my right side, because I know where it's at, right? So I come up and start speaking. And all of a sudden, seven, eight minutes into this thing, I look up, and all of a sudden, I see these two little boys, seven, eight years old, start walking down this aisle. Now listen, I was a seven, eight-year-old boy. I'd do anything to get out of church. You know, I'd go wash my hands, go to the bathroom, have a smoke, anything, right? Get out of church, right? Uh, and I said, these guys are out of here. But they weren't. They took a hard right and stood in front of this picture. It was like right here, stood in front of this picture while I'm talking. Now, everybody's looking, right? It's like, what are these boys gonna do? You don't know what these boys are gonna do, right? They could do anything. And one of them interrupted me. One of the boys looked up and said, 
this is a miracle. And everybody got real quiet. The other boy said, he's a miracle man. Looked at me, turned, walked away, no big deal. I looked at my wife and she is bawling. And she got it. So she had to see, why does Dave do what Dave does? See, she could care less that I'm with you guys tonight, but I impacted a youth who now believes there's a Jesus because I was there. And that meant more to my wife than anything. That's when my wife allows me to do what I do because of that moment, that moment truly mattered to our family. A couple years later, I was honored to be asked to speak at our 9-11 services in Charlotte. Honored, that was, that was a great honor. I don't know if they do it here in, in the Nashville area, but it's a great honor. And you know, it's with your dignitaries and the military and first responders and fought law. It's an amazing experience. Now, my minister had only seen me speak inside the church. So I said, hey, Ken, why don't you come out with me to see me? It's gonna be a different talk, right? It's gonna be about thankfulness, right? The first responders. So I went out, he came out with me to do this thing, right? We get done and we're walking back to the car. And he looked at me and said, listen, Dave, I wanna tell you something. I was listening to you talk. He said, in the Methodist faith, we believe you're only baptized once into the faith. He said, but I was listening to you. It's like you went in the water that day and you, when you came out, everything opened up. It's like you were rebaptized. It's like God all of a sudden shone on you. He said, everybody has a ministry. All of you and I have a ministry. He says, your ministry is speaking. Never give up speaking. This is how God is using you. That's why I do what I do. Because he saw something, I came out of the water, just like all of us. That'll be that moment. I talk about the personal plane crash. Everybody's got that traumatic life experience. All of us. You may not come out of the water physically like I do, but you'll come out of the water where they have a heart attack, stroke, tornado, hurricane, something. You'll come out of the water and God will shine on you. Last story I'll share is this. I was asked, I got a phone call out of the blue from Taiwan. They asked if they could do, I'd do an interview in Taiwan for Radio Free China, trying to get the message of God into China, right? And I was all in, not only because of that, because my, my cousin was one of those kids who were arrested back at Tiananmen Square for handing out Bibles. She was arrested. So I'm all in. So I do this interview in this, over in Taiwan. And what they did is very cool. They interviewed me in English. They translated it into Mandarin. They sent it over, right? Very cool. Didn't think about it for a little while. I'm a, on the Sunday before Pentecost at our church. Now, I, that, that, that year, back then, those three years, every other Sunday I was speaking at a different church. So, you know, I was, I was home maybe once, twice a month, maybe. So we were at church, and all of a sudden, you know, services began, and Reverend Ken's up there, right, talking. He gets to the scripture lesson. And remember, the Sunday before Pentecost, I don't know whether it's big here or not, but it's when Jesus gives the final commandment, right? Final commandment, he tells everybody to go out to Samaria, Judea, and the world, and, and the Holy Spirit will fill you. He said, and that's what Dave Sanderson is doing. And my daughter said, Dad, are you awake? I said, oh, yeah, I'm awake now. Everybody's looking at me. But what he found out is this, and I found out from him. His daughter was in Beijing going to school. She heard my message in Mandarin and heard me talk about Providence, where I go to church, called her dad, said, you got somebody over here talking about, about your church in here. And that's when I realized this is what we're all about. It's about that final commandment, right? God, if you go out and do what you're supposed to do, that final commission, the Holy Spirit will fill you. And that's why I do what I do, because I think that's what happened. He gave me the commandment. I had to step up. Now I've gone to over 10 different countries doing this because God gave me that commandment. He gives us all that commandment. It's fighting the good fight. So that's what, you know, if you go back, think about this. Go back to 2009 in your mind. There wasn't a lot of positive things happening in the country, but all of a sudden, you had a crew and passenger that did something that had never been done in the history of aviation. One team, one goal, one miracle and it gave people hope. There's a passage in the Bible that says, suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. That's what only happened that day. That's what I get to do every single day now, and that's what our call right is for all of us men to do this, go out and give people hope. This is why we're here. How can we go out and give people hope? This is what you're all about right now. It's all about going out and giving people hope. This is what our call is. Go out to the Great Commission, give people hope. 
I'm gonna end up with this. You know, there's, God gives you secrets, right? When you go through something like this, and everybody goes through something, God lives lets secrets in your head. Sometimes they don't come out for a while. But I wanna sort of give you, what, you know, some of those secrets, some of the things I learned through this experience that God opened up in my mind and now hopefully you can take away tonight and you can impact somebody else's life with some of them. First thing is this, process saves lives. It may not be your physical life, it might be your spiritual life. So one thing I learned about this is this, you have to be intentional with your faith. You have to step up and do it. You can't wait for somebody else to do it for you. You have to have a process for being intentional with your faith or your faith will not exist. Process saves lives. Second, casualness leads to casualties. You can't be casual with relationships, guys. You gotta, you gotta be intentional once again. You can't be casual, because if you're casual with your faith, casual with your, with your relationships, people go away. You gotta stay on it. You gotta be focused. You gotta be serious about relationships because that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to bring people to the faith. Do not be casual or casualties can happen. People value, value people. I'll look at, let's look at Jesus in the human form, not the spiritual form, the human form. What did Jesus value most on earth? Relationships with people. It says in the Bible, Jesus didn't hang out with the cool kids. Jesus hung out with everybody, right? He valued people. People of value, value people. Be somebody of value. Value somebody else's life. That's part of the problem in this country now. We don't value life enough. Jesus wants us to value life. People of value, value people. The power of teamwork. How do 155 people who do not know each other or care about each other do something in less than six minutes that had never been done in history? There's two things. Number one, you check your ego at the door. God wants you to check your ego at the door, right? Ego, edging God out. He wants you to check your ego at the door and step up. You know, when you're going down in a plane crash, guys, I'm gonna give you a secret. I don't care if you're the CEO of of the biggest company in the country, ExxonMobil, or you're the guy who's who's cleaning the toilets at midnight. Everybody's the same. Nobody's any better than anybody else. You check your ego at the door. And when given the opportunity to lead, you lead. That's what happens. That's what happened that day. I had the opportunity in 1999 to escort a guy by the name of General Norman Schwarzkopf. Have you ever know Schwarzkopf? Ever heard of him? You ever been around, ever been around a four-star general? Very intimidating. But I had the opportunity to talk to him. And one of the things he shared with me is this, is when you're given the opportunity to lead, you step up and lead. God gives you that strength. You gotta lead. It's your personal leadership skills. That's why I teach personal leadership skills and servant leadership. It's the power of teamwork. Coming together. What, you know, and look at, just look at Jesus. Jesus always hung out with a team. He has disciples, right? He always had somebody with him. He wants you to be around a team. He wants you to lead a team. But last but not least, grace is fueled by gratitude. What is gratitude? It's giving thanks to God. About once or twice every month, I get a question. Hey, Dave, do you really think this is a miracle? I said, well, you know, I don't know. I tell people, I said, I don't know. But one thing I do know is this. There's a lot of things that men can't accomplish but with God, all things are, can be accomplished. And what is a miracle given from God? You get more grace by more gratitude. That's why every day I pray for grace, pray for, pray for wisdom, great, pray, pray, you know, pray for all these things because I want that moment, I wanna have so much grace that when something happens, I'm there. God's gonna use me in the way he needs to use me. Grace is fueled by gratitude. I wanna say thank you for having me tonight. I'll leave you with this. There was a group of people for a thousand years that lived in the land of not enough. But all of a sudden, God chose a leader, sent them into that land, and took them out of that land to a land of just enough. And for 40 years, they were in this land until God found leaders. God found people who were, who were servant leadership mindset and moved them from the land of just enough the land of more than enough. My wish for you is this. You come out of here tonight, you become one of those leaders for God. You take your family, you take your team, you take your businesses from a land of just enough, step up and be a servant leader like God asked you to do, like God did those many years ago and move them from a land of just enough to a land of more than enough. God wants us all to have more than enough. When I say God bless you, May God bless Long Hollow Baptist. I am honored to be here tonight. But most importantly, right now, may God bless the United States.
We need a lot of help in this country. And the only way it's gonna happen is for men like us to step up, believe in God and get this message out. So when stuff starts hitting the fan, God knows he has an army out there to help him execute his plan. God bless you guys. Thank you very much.